good morning. Welcome. It's Facebook Live Wednesday at beadshop.com. It's January 31st. Can't believe we've made it through the first month of 2018. There's been so many things going on, and most importantly, Tucson is happening right now. And if I feel, if I sound excited, I have to tell you I am. I'm going to be getting on a plane in a few hours, winging my way to Tucson. I'll meet up with Kate, and we'll get to have some fun for a couple of days. And then we'll be back. So we'll be back next Wednesday, too. Don't worry. I'm Emily Miller. Brandwin's behind the camera. Janice is moderating from the East Coast. Drea's probably on. And I hope Drea's feeling better, too. And Gita, hopefully, is feeling better where she is. And I, and I hope you do. Take care of yourself, please. Uh, good morning, again. It's a beautiful, sunny day here in California. We're having, like, 70 degrees, which is crazy. <laughs> in January. Look at this, almost said February. <laughs> so Kate's here. Hi Kate. How are you? I know you're having fun. I can't wait to see you tonight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing says get get moving get a move on like having an airplane you have to catch later today. Right? So we're gonna talk today um, primarily about wire and working with wire for making jewelry. One of the things that I really like about working with wire is that you make things sort of from scratch, from beginning to end. And that's empowering. And it also is sometimes a place where your inner critic comes out and says, yeah, that doesn't look so great. It's okay. Wire takes a little bit of time to master. And once you master it, you have those skills in your toolbox forever. If you feel like you've put your wire aside for some time, maybe it's been a while, it's okay to also get your wire out and do some practicing. And in fact, I will do some what I call warm-ups if um, I feel like I haven't done any wire working in a while. Unbeknownst to you, earlier today, before anybody else got here, I did my little bit of wire warm-ups. So I've already kind of got the bad ones out of the way. So we're going to talk today um, about wire, tools, making loops, using some beads. I've got a bunch of samples of my own work and a few things I made just for the show to show you. And I just want to check in with Brandwin and, and everybody and see how everybody's coming along. Any questions, Brandwin? People joining us we need to say hi to? What's going on out there? Everybody's excited that Kate's on. And, and uh, we've got some nice comments about you, that you look lovely. Thank and you. Says, uh, Thank hello. you. So, uh, Excellent. And uh, Gita says, happy sneezing. <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. Gita, I'm sorry. It's going around here, too. We're having a really bad run of the flu in the in. The United States, and and I, I hope you feel better soon. I know it's it's really a drag, so drink lots of fluids, get lots of rest, quietly bead while you're in bed. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go ahead and hit this the way we always like to do, going right for it. Um, like I have done with some of my other seed beading classes, I tend to like to make a little handout for you, a little something that you can have to follow along with. I think Kate's gonna post this on our feed in the um, bead shop community group um, but ultimately this will be part of the episode notes that Janice and Drea will work on and have finished for you next week remember too that you can watch us later um, from our website uh, from Facebook or from YouTube uh, we put our videos there when we're all done as well so I'm gonna I'll let Brandon take a picture of this kind of close up and then you'll be able to look at it later one of the things that is kind of important to me when I'm teaching a class about wire is that I have a clear understanding that you know what I mean when I say wire. You know, we talk a lot about uh, soft flex material and then we kind of throw wire off. We say might say stringing wire and stringing material. I like to call soft flex or those types of materials generically flexible stringing material. It's one of those easier ways to describe it. It's made up of multiple strands of flexible material with a plastic coating on the outside. And so it's meant to be flexible. It's not meant to have any sharp corners or bends or kinks. And that's kind of the opposite of the wire we're going to work with today. So one thing you might do is call this by itself wire and the other stuff stringing material. That helps differentiate it too. Some folks like to call this hard wire, so it's different from flexible wire. And that's just a personal choice. You can do either way, um, just so you all know what we're talking about today. Wire uh, like this is metal, and it's it's, it's uh, labeled in what's called gauge. And here in the states, we use American standard gauge. Um, elsewhere around the world, they use millimeters. So this little handout that I made actually has a little breakdown of the different gauges that are pretty commonly used, um, 16 through about 28. 
and what type of loops we might make with those, which we'll get to in a minute, the types of beads that you might find that you would work with on that type of wire, and the types of other things that you might make with them, clasps, findings, earrings, ear wires, things like that. So when you're picking a wire gauge, there's a couple of things that you're going to want to think about. Um, one of those major things to think about is, of course, will the wire fit through my beads? And that's probably starting place number one. So we'll think about the wire fitting through the hole of the beads, natural beads like pearls or stone, um, especially fine gemstones, um, semi-precious stones tend to have fairly small holes. They're drilled through. And glass beads, on the other hand, the hole is made while the bead is in the liquid state or the molten state, the glass. And so it tends to have a bigger, easier to work with hole, which gives you a few more options, which is kind of nice. It's nice to be able to have choices of how those wires might look on your beads. The other thing we're going to think about kind of as a primary thought is what type of loop we're going to make. And Brando and I want to hold up a couple of pieces um, to show the difference between two types of loops. This is also referenced on your handout right up here in the corner, wrapped loops and simple loops. So there's two kinds of loops that we make for wire working. One of them would be a simple loop. And if you can see this nice and clear, because I did it with some big Belize uh, 10 millimeter beads. Hold it up beads. just a little bit. You're How's in the, the, the screen, but did you hold it up just a little bit? Up towards you a little bit more? Yeah, just... How about like that? Ah, perfect. Okay. These are our nice big uh, Belize Amazonite beads. And I used some 16 gauge wire, which is really pretty beefy for wire working. But I really liked it because I can make these plain, simple loops. So these loops are sort of like a jump ring attached to a, a, the rest of our wire. I'm actually going to make one more suggestion. Sure. Just because if you hold it up just a little bit higher, the, 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 your shirt is going to get that background. Background, perfect. And then they'll really be able to see it okay. uh, behind it. That perfect. That's another reason to wear black today, huh? Yeah. So these are simple loops. You'll notice that they are open and openable. So I can use that opening and closing quality the same way I would a jump ring. Um, open and close it to connect it. I don't have to connect these as I go along, which is a little different from the wrap loops I'll show you next. So this is done with some uh, 16 gauge wire and I would make simple loops right down to about 22 gauge. Now, when I say down and I say a number that's bigger, it's a little confusing, isn't it? Wire gauges are a little confusing, just a tiny bit. As the number gets bigger on the scale, so closer to 100, the wire size is actually getting smaller and thinner. Everybody get that? Sometimes if you think of things as a fraction, it makes it easier. Would you rather have a 1 16th of a slice of cake or a 1 26th slice of cake? Well, I'd rather have the 1 16th, it's bigger. Right? So simple loops, we open and close them just the same way we would open and close a jump ring. Not by undoing the loop, taking it out of round, but by swinging it open with our chain nose pliers. Okay? So let me show you a wrapped loop for comparison. So a wrapped loop, and here again, same beads, little bit smaller wire. This time I did some 18 gauge wire. So 18 gauge is pretty beefy for wire wrapping too. But I sort of liked balancing that larger size of wire against these larger beads. So these beautiful billies are such a nice bead to work with. They have a really good large hole. And it's actually one of the qualities that you might want to watch out for when you're buying a semi-precious stone bead is that the hole is nicely drilled. It's even, both sides big as the other. And that the hole is true. It goes straight through the middle of the, of the round bead. Okay. So wrapped loops, as you can see here, have that little wrapping right at their base of the loop, moving down towards the bead. So what's kind of fun is that I actually created this link from nothing. A straight piece of wire and two beads, and suddenly I have jewelry. I have a link. The necklace that I have on, all made up of pearls with wrapped loops, and I threw in a jump ring in between each one to give it a little bit more of a chain-like appearance. But wrap loops are really secure. If you're not going to solder, and it's tough to solder up against a bead, a wrap loop is really the most secure way to join a bead link to chain, to soft flex, flexible stringing material, um, to a component, 
to chain mail if you like. All those different things are possible. So wrapped loops versus simple loops. I'm going to do both today and I want to make sure that you know about um, how those tools and wires work. All right. So there's a couple other terms that we can talk about when we talk about wire and it's something that comes up with folks and, and they get sort of confused about it. Um, how hard the wire is or how stiff our wire is. And there's a couple of technical terms that the jewelers use. Half hard and dead soft. So wire that's dead soft is wire that's at its most flexible state. Right? If I was going to crochet with my wire, for instance, I would want my wire to be dead soft, really flexible. Half hard wire has been pre-made into a hardness. And the way they do that is they actually make the wire, they draw the wire through a metal plate. And that stiffens the wire by disrupting the bonds in, in the metal itself and making it a little bit more stiff, harder to bend. So dead soft and half hard They'll come your way and you'll hear us use those terms and want to know what they are. We can also affect the hardness of wire by something called work hardening and by annealing. So work hardening, you might have already seen Kate or I do, um, by using a nylon jawed tool. This is our nylon jawed wire plier. And we can actually use it to straighten our wire, pulling our wire through, pulling it across our wire. And as I do that, I'm actually work hardening my piece. So any manipulation that you do at all to the wire will stiffen that wire up. So that would be hammering, twisting, bending, curving, manipulating, anything like that. Okay? Work hardening comes to us all. Some of the good parts about work hardening is it makes the loops hold their shape a bit better. And that's good for us. We want those loops to not change their shape. One of the bad sides to work hardening is your wire can get so brittle that it's delicate. It can actually be something that could bend or break. Brandon, we got any questions? I um, have, a, you have a thoughtful look on your face. Well, I was wondering if I should move the camera closer to your hands. We're going to be doing mostly hand stuff or because I... We were okay, I think, at the moment. Just um, kind of in between. Somebody had a, asked a question about no jump ring in between, but I wasn't sure what they in between. Oh, I had a jump ring in between here, yeah. but no jump rings in between these two. Okay. All right. So that was the only That was question. the big question? All right, cool. So work hardening, something that happens while you manipulate the wire, and annealing is kind of the opposite to work hardening. We could actually heat our wire with a torch, and that would actually relax the wire and make it flexible again. We don't have to bend it while it's hot, which is a good point, but we can absolutely have our wire be more flexible again as we need to, okay? So I've got a bunch of different wire types here in our picture. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> Brandwin will move over. Actually, we can probably start coming down okay. now if you like, Brandwin. That, that, uh, <laughs> that's not nowhere close to the Sorry. picture. <laughs> I just looked over and saw it out of the corner of my eye. And I'm going to pull this just over a little bit. There we go. There. Okay. All right, so there we go. We got some, some wire in the picture now. Okay, <laughs> terrific. So I've got a pretty good, good um, pile of wire here to work with. And these are um, all base metal wires. So these are wires that are copper cord with a plating on the outside. And they come in a huge variety of colors. I've got everything from shiny silver to matte silver to gold to copper, antique bronze, antique copper, just a wide variety of these wires. Um, I like working with these because they're really affordable and they come in so many gauges and sizes. Um, and it really does mean you can match your findings, your clasps or head pins or eye pins, um, or pick things that uh, you haven't worked with before. We've done a bit of mixing of metals lately, uh, certainly Janice in her last class where we did um, uh, the uh, multiple strand bracelet was really free with mixing her bronzes and brasses and coppers and things all together. And I really like that approach. Um, so we can use all of these wires together and they come in gauges just like I already talked about. And it'll say it very clearly right on the label. One thing to notice is this one actually says it's a non-tarnish wire, which is good. We don't want it to change color. And if this 
if there's no showing around here on this label of what hardness this wire is, you can pretty much assume it's going to be a dead soft, so a wire that's super flexible and easy to bend and manipulate. You know, you could also work with copper wire, bronze wire, uh, sterling silver wire, fine silver wire, gold filled, or even gold wire if you wanted. Um, they're more expensive, but they definitely have a place in our jewelry arsenal. And I tend to work with more sterling silver. It's kind of one of those silver colors that I really like. One thing I can do with sterling silver is I can oxidize it to match um, the, the uh, chain or beads that I'm going to work with. This is a necklace that I did just using some clear quartz crystal beads that are a rondelle shape. So this is very similar to our um, faceted crystal clear bead. And I did it on some sterling silver wire, and it was all silver, and this sterling silver chain, it was all silver, and then I oxidized it, I turned it black. And one of the things that does is it makes those crystal beads really kind of shine up and, and pop a little bit more. It's just a, a technique that I like to work with um, where I can change the color of my metal. And that's one of the things that sterling silver is doable for. It also means that you have to polish your wire or polish your jewelry, which if you're not a big fan of that, using these, these plated or coated wires, that's a really great use. You don't ever have to polish them. They're not going to tarnish for you. Okay. So, in fact, this is a, a wrapped loop, which is the most secure to add with chain. And putting it with the chain and the beads, the loop kind of disappears a little bit, right? It looks like somehow magically I've got that bead hanging out in the middle of that chain. Another thing to think about when you're working with wire is the fact that you're going to need some tools. And you're going to need a few, not a ton, but a few things to work with. One of the tools you're going to want to have is a flush cutter. And flush cutters are tools that we use for cutting wire. We can also use these for cutting flexible stringing material or soft flex wire. But really what we want to notice about is how they work. These flush cutters um, work by making one flush or blunt cut on the end of the wire. The back side here that I'm turning around for you now, if you notice the two blades come together and they're flat on this side. If we turn it over on the other side, see how they're angled in? So the cut that we would get from this type of flush cutter is going to be um, different on both sides of the cut that we make. Let me make one for you. Let's grab a big wire so I can show you what it looks like. And I'm just going to cut a piece to play with. So if I take my flush cutter and bring the bottom side of the flush cutter straight across at a 90 degree angle across the wire and then cut, I actually end up with two different types of cuts. So this little scrap wire that I cut off, if you can see that, I'm going to rotate it just a little bit in the light. It's got a really sharp tapered chisel point on it now, which is pretty rough and scratchy. And that, that would be most uncomfortable against your skin. On the other longer wire, over here on my left hand, you can see that I have a nice flat and blunt cut. So this side is not so pokey, this side's a little scratchier, and I would try to avoid having that on my jewelry. It's actually easier to make a loop, a simple loop, with this side of the, of the wire as well, because you can grasp right at the end. If you're grasping on the end of this non-flush cut, it's a little bit um, harder to hold on to that end. So flush cutters, really these are um, a tool for cutting wire. We want to avoid, however, cutting memory wire with them. I can't say this enough. Do not use this tool for cutting on your memory wire. Okay. The next kind of tool we m are really going to need is a flush, is a uh, flat nose or chain nose plier. So <clears throat> chain nose pliers are different from needle nose pliers. They have a similar tapered jaw but there's no teeth on the inside. It's smooth and clean. This means that I can grasp my wire and hold on to it while I'm bending it or manipulating it, or I can push around little, end, little ends as needed. Won't hurt my fingers. It's tapered, so I can get into tight spots, or if I grip further up in the jaw, I get a better grip, and I can hold on to things with a little less effort. 
I always look for chain nose pliers that have nice even jaws where they meet together, the tips look the same, and there should be no rough burrs or scuffy bits on the inside of the jaws because that's going to just mar your wire. Okay. Round nose pliers are critical for wire working. You cannot work, make wire work without round nose pliers. Okay. Round nose pliers are what we shape the wire around to make the loop that we're creating out of wire. So that loop fits right on there and it takes up the form of that jaw of the plier. Right. Round nose pliers are tapered, so you can make small loops or bigger loops. Bigger loops for things like bigger wire, bigger loops for maybe making jump rings, bigger loops for maybe making ear wires or clasps. Round nose pliers have the same kind of uh, deal as chain nose pliers. You'd like to look at them carefully, make sure the jaws are nice and even, um, they're nice and smooth. and both round nose and chain nose pliers should have really comfortable handles. You know, um, I have sort of average to big hands. I do like these hand pliers. I love the grips on the handles. They're very comfortable. Um, they're slightly non-slip, but they're not grippy. I can really relax and let go of these easily. They aren't sticky or anything. And they have a, a double leaf spring, which is also real important. This way you don't have to open the tool. Okay. And lastly, I think really a critical tool to have is a nylon jawed plier. Now, this is one of those tools that you may not even know that you need it until you have one and start using it. I use this to straighten my wire, taking out the little bends and bumps and kinks in it while I'm working with it. And I want to make sure my wire is smooth to work with so that I don't spend a lot of time on something that doesn't look great to start with. Nylon jawed pliers, um, the jaws of the nylon are soft. They don't mar the wire. They allow you to grip pretty firmly. They have nylon screws even in the back. So these jaws are actually replaceable, but you want to make sure you have the type that has the nylon screw so that when you want to replace the jaws, the nylon screws come out easily and they don't poke through and mar your wire like a metal one would. Okay. So nylon jaw tools usually don't have springs. And one of the things that you want to be a little bit careful with when you're using them is to avoid putting your pointer finger in the middle there. It's actually kind of easy to pinch yourself. It's pretty uncomfortable if you do. So I always use my ring finger and um, pinky finger to help me open and close my jaw of my tools. Right? Just like that. And one of the interesting things to think about with tools uh, as you're working with them is if you grip something in the tip of the tool out here, you actually have to apply more force with your hand to get a good grip on it versus gripping back here in the back part of the jaws you actually grip a little less so you have to expend a little less force I know we've talked several times um, in Facebook lives about hand fatigue and wrist issues and problems like that the best advice I can give you is take regular breaks every 45 minutes or so take a break um, stretch and relax your hands and wrists. Do something else for a few minutes. Unload the dishwasher or start something cooking on the stove so you have to come back to it. Do something else for a few minutes and that will actually help in the long haul for your for your hands and wrists. Okay. So I'm going to start off by doing um, a little bit of simple loop wrapping. And I'm going to use some head pins and eye pins and head pins and eye pins are pre-made pieces of wire that we can work with. Um, and I find head pins and eye pins really kind of the quick way to get to an earring. Now I picked out a few beads that we had um, floating around here at beachhop.com because we always have a few floating around. Um, I picked out some rondelles larger rondelles and some melon beads. This is the glazed peach rondelle and the champagne turquoise Picasso in the melon. Now I want to show you that strand of champagne um, turquoise Picasso. If you decide to play around with this one, keep in mind that these beads vary a little bit on this strand. There's a few darker and a few lighter. They're not a perfect uh, little match, but I kind of like that because I think it's for earrings and things it's kind of fun to have a few bits and pieces around. Um, I also pulled out some spacer beads 
And you know, we have a really good variety of beads you can use for spacers. The way to add something to a quick little pair of earrings is to throw some spacer beads in. So here are the uh, Tierra Cast Plain Hishi. These are the Gilding Mat seed beads. So that's that little metal mat bead. I love those. And I know they're one of Kate's favorite colors. And of course, shadows. What would a design bit the bead shop be without a shadow in here? Because shadows are lovely, you know? They make great little spacer beads. Um, these ones I used on this, on this earring here, these are the little temple beads, which is kind of a new bead for us. It's, we haven't had it for very long. It's kind of like a little gear. I like the texture on the outside edge, and it kind of relates to that, to that rondelle. And I did pull a pair of ear wires out. So these are just our niobium um, copper ear wires with the ball, so the antique copper. Okay. So I've got some head pins and eye pins, and I'm going to grab a couple of beads. You know, everybody makes earrings a little bit differently. I have this thing about earrings. <clears throat> I think earrings can be um, quite lovely, but earrings by their very nature are supposed to be a pair. And that means they should look alike and should be about the same length and about the same style. So if you are making a pair of earrings, I think one of the most sensible things you can do is actually make it on the assembly line. So you'd make the same move on each earring as you go along. And then they get done kind of at the same moment. So I have some copper head pins and copper eye pins, and I'm going to play around with mixing a few little bit of, bits of metal in here. I've got these little silver um, hishi that I think are real pretty, and that's going to add a little oomph. I'm going to slide those guys on. And I tend to like to kind of do my little design uh, and not make the loop yet until I have a chance to look at all my beads laid out for me. Okay? That looks kind of pretty. You know, that glazed peach bead is um, its kind of a very nice, subtle sparkle and a very pretty kind of uh, sparkle that goes with the copper, I think. And just to keep that theme of mixed metals going, I'm going to use the gilding mat um, for my next stack. And I'm going to stack them on an eye pin. And, you know, eye pins and head pins are kind of handy to have around. You can actually use these to do your lanes that Janice likes to do on. And I know Kate calls this auditioning her beads. So I kind of just do like a little, like to do a little layout that allows me to kind of preview what I'm doing here so that I have a, a little chance to change something if I like. Okay. If you were going to make your own um, head pins, what gauge would you use? I would probably go 22 and larger for my own head pins. You can make your own head pins. It's not hard at all. You can use a hammer to flatten a little bit of wire to make a little paddle to keep the beads from coming off. You could uh, make a little coil or a little spiral at the bottom. That makes a great head pin. So there's lots of choices. Yeah, yeah. But about 22 gauge would probably be my, my go-to size. 22 gauge and anything bigger, 20, 18, and on up. Okay. So I'm replicating this little earring, but you know, one thing that's fun to think about is to move that bigger bead on the top. And this would require me changing the wires that I'm on. But having a, a big bead at the bottom of the earring is kind of one way to go, but it's sort of nice to know that you can actually design it the other way as well. Having a little bit of a taper. Brandwood's earrings that you can't see right now have a little bit of the same little taper. They're kind of smaller as they go down to the bottom. Pardon? Cara made them. Cara made them. Oh, they're really pretty. Put them yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm going to go ahead and I am going to make this switch because, uh, you know, I can't leave well enough alone here. And uh, I'm just going to move my beads from the head pins to the eye pins and vice versa so that I have kind of my own little design going here with all my little mixed metals and my fun little, little beads. Good to see Gita on on the uh, on the screen there. It's very nice. And a nice little shout out. Thank yes, you. and a shout out for Brandwin because we couldn't do it without her. It's the best. Everybody else is busy working, so Brandwin and I are doing a different kind of working. So I think I may do may do this. 
putting my smaller beads on the bottom of my earring and my bigger beads on top. Okay, and still keeping with that mixed metals theme. I really like these um, ones with the little copper ball. But you know, there's another earring that I kind of like too. Earwear. These little, these kind of giant kidneys. Although I think this may be too much metal mixing. Just might be a thought. <laughs> <laughs> right? What do you think? That's great. You like these guys? I already like these ones. Brand one. Give me a give me a call. Uh, I, I like those. Okay. We're going to go with brand one's call. All right. So for this uh, exercise, I'm going to make simple loops matching the one that's on the bottom and a simple loop here and then link them together. Okay. And simple loops are, are pretty simple. Um, they have just a very modest amount of tool need and a modest amount of, of effort. They do take a little bit of practicing, but this is a, I can show you a way where your loops will always come out the same on this earring. So a simple loop is going to begin with my wire bent at a 90 degree angle. And since I would like my loop to be right up against this spacer bead, I'm actually just going to use my hands and fingers and I'm going to bend the wire right across the top of that little spacer bead. Okay? And since this is the assembly line, I'm going to do it the same for both sides. Okay? Now, these little beads are giving us a little bit of fits because they want to they want to wiggle around. Okay? And while I'm here, I'm going to do the same thing for my eye pins. bend it over, take the next one, bend it over as well. Okay. So now I'm going to cut off some extra wire. And what I want to do is remove the wire I don't need here so that this bit is going to be waste. That little bit left over is going to be my the rest of my loop. To do this so that they match and the, my loops come out the same size, one thing I can do is actually cut, leaving some wire behind. And remember that flush cut, right? I want to use my flat side of my flush cutter toward my work. Cut that off. Since I know these beads were all the same size and the head pins were the same size, all I need to do is remove a matching amount on the other side. So I'm going to carefully get in there and take that off. Oh, my little bead came off. That's OK. I can put him right back on. All right. So once I've got that little 90 degree bend made in my wire, I'm going to switch tools and I'm going to move over to my round nose plier. I like to turn the wire so that little short piece is pointing right at me and I'm going to grab the end of that short piece of wire with my tool. So here's where all the magic happens. Keep an eye on it. I'm going to bend going around the jaw of my plier, bending that wire as I go until it gets all the way around. And now I need to take a look at it from the side. So I'm going to turn to the side. That little bead's kind of in the way, isn't it? I need to go just a little further, but that bead needs to slide down. I'm just going to make a little adjustment and bring my loop right around to touch at the top of that little spacer bead little space should be really not helping out things. So there's one loop. I'm going to get to the next one and do the same thing. I need to get a I'm going to pause here for Brandwin. Um, Question? How much, wire, how much wire to leave when cutting off? Ah, So that depends on how big a loop or how small a loop you'd like to make. And it takes a little bit of practice, but there's a, I can give you a good sort of a rule of thumb. Gita, I hope you know what rule of thumb means. Is that a lot of questions? That, that there's like everybody's asking that. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, let me show you a little rule of thumb here. With this style plier and this size plier, if my short piece of wire that I've produced is smaller than half an inch, which is what I did do just now, where did that ruler go? Didn't I have a ruler out here just a second ago? There he is. If the short piece I make is smaller than a half an inch, so in this neck of the woods, I will be at about midway, midpoint on my plier, or a little smaller. 
if the amount of wire I've cut is bigger than half an inch, I'll be moving up from the jaw of the plier towards the hinge, towards the bigger part. Does that make sense? Oh good, Gita knows that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so half an inch of wire by the bead means halfway in the jaws or smaller. Half an inch larger is going to be halfway or the larger end of the plier. All right. That slow them down some? <laughs> so let's do that again. I'm going to cut some wire off and then we'll, we'll measure and you'll see. So I'm going to pick up my flush cutter. Okay, flat side of my flush cutter towards my bead. And then I'm going to cut it off. Okay. Take my piece of wire over to my repeated piece, flat side of the flush cutter towards the bead, and cut it off. Sorry. Did I move too quick? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Now, ruler. Come here, you. Let's measure. My short piece of wire is smaller than a half an inch. So, would that mean that I would want to make my loop up here? At this big end of the plier, do you think? What do you think? No? How about if I go down past the halfway point, maybe just a little bit, like that? I think that's about the right spot. I might go just a smidge smaller. I'm going to grab a hold of that wire and I'm going to roll my hand over, right? Loosen and turn the plier back and then just walk it forward until it touches. I made myself a little crazy with having those spacer beads on there, but not too bad. Yeah? Let's do it again. Now one thing that's kind of nice about doing this assembly line process is if this loop looked good, all I need to do is remember to do the next one the same place. Grab a hold of my wire, roll my hand over, heading for that spacer bead, loosen my grip, roll the wire, my plier back, and walk that plier around till it's closed. Not too bad. I've got two links ready to be made into earrings. Okay? So, still playing with the idea of matching these up and doing that layout decision-making time, I'm still pretty pleased with how that looks. This was my first one. This is the one I made to show you what I was going to do. And this is the one that I made today. So to open and close those loops, I can open and close any of these simple loops that I've got a hold of here. I'm going to use my chain nose plier. I'm going to grab right next to the loop and I'm going to swing it open. What does Kate say about loops? They're either open or closed, right? So here he's open. I'm going to pick up another bead, slide him on, now they're linked loop to loop, and I'm going to close that loop. All right? So that's one down. Now this one I can see is a little open yet. That's all right. I'm going to fix him when I put him when I close it. Swinging it open to the side, picking up a loop, attaching it, loop to loop, and then swinging it closed and pushing it a little tighter as I go almost there, right? I don't know, how long did it take me to make a pair of earrings? Even with all the yakking, it might have been about 10 minutes. So, Christmas time comes around. I make a lot of earrings for my sisters and nieces and nephews' girlfriends and sister-in-law's sisters and sister-in-law's sister's son's girlfriend and her three daughters. So, one way to do this is to line up an assembly line. 
line up 10 pairs all at once and just make the same move over and over again. It will actually make you come up with earrings pretty quickly. You don't have to redesign the wheel. They're all happy to have the same pair. They don't mind. So I'm going to open up the loop, the simple loop on my ear wire. So notice that right here, this is just a simple loop. It's the same as the loops that we made over here. I'm going to grab it with my chain nose plier and I'm going to swing it to the side, pick up one of my earrings. Notice how that went from being links to being an earring and swing it closed again. All right. One earring. Next one, same process. Grab a hold of that loop right next to where it opens. Swing it open. Like what Jenna said about like a kickstand on a bike. That's right. I think of it sometimes like a gate swinging open. But yes, like a kickstand on a bike. That's a good one. Okay. And there's a really sweet, easy pair of earrings. You know, I didn't even break open any new strands for these, Janice. These were all ones we'd already had floating around the store. So these are easy to have, a couple extra beads, easy to make earrings out of them. I always try to kind of pull my collections together that way. Now, I like simple loops, especially like them for earrings. Here's a little earring that I made a few years ago with a really pretty wire finding. And notice that I used these links to attach more findings below them. So these are just a little finding or a component that we might use for, for making earrings. These particular beads are called English cuts. And these are some vintage ones that I've had for a long time and I really like them. We're just gonna have some new ones showing up here real soon. The next few days we'll be having some English cuts and they're really a pretty bead. They have kind of a coarse facet on them. So they're not quite as sparkly as the fire polish, but they really are a really attractive little bead. So this gives me a, um, an earring that has lots of movement and lots of swing to it. Um, I really like using that simple loop. I would make simple loops um, at down to about 22 gauge. Once you get down to 24 gauge, the wire might not be stiff enough or, or hard enough to hold its shape too well. And so I would give that up and start making wrap loops when you get to 24 gauge. But wrap loops can be made with lots of different sizes of wire. And I made a couple little bracelets almost to completion um, to show you what I would do. Here again is that, mm, that little peach bead. Isn't that nice? And this is with some antique copper wire. Oh, I love it. And then I picked out our big, um, big potato pearls. And I found a couple of these little crystal beads. I think this was in a Facebook giveaway a few weeks, few, maybe a month back. And I made a couple little bracelet lengths of these. And these are two different wires, um, 24 gauge and 22 gauge. So the fineness of that 24, I think, really works well with how these pearls look. And remember, too, pearls have a drilled hole, so they're going to need a smaller gauge of wire. Okay. So I wire wrap these links together, and I, in essence, made my own chain. Re really, what all I have to do on this one is add the clasp. And I picked out a couple of clasps, a couple of choices. One might be this plain and simple, I think, or plain, plain clasp. And also I picked out this little guy, which I really sort of like, because it goes with the, the bead theme, right? Love him. Brandon, can you remind me of his name? Cutie, cutie, that's what it is. I kept thinking of tangerines. <laughs> <laughs> cutie is this little, little, little magnetic one. You know, it kind of goes along with those that beaded appearance, right? Any questions for me, Brandwin? Uh, Janice has been really on top of answering Excellent. the questions, so Excellent. good. Good, good. Everybody feeling like they're catching on? Liking it? Good. Good. So I'm going to show you how to do a wrapped loop as well here. And wrapped loops are uh, much more sturdy than a simple loop. They add a little bit of decorative uh, touch to it as well. Um, and it'd be the loop that I would want to use when I was incorporating wire, uh, stringing wire like Softflex or chain um, to my pieces. You know, I, I do like having a little bit of chain and I will put some beads in between. I showed you this one earlier. Um, but here's a little necklace as well that's got 
some sections of chain um, with some pearls and some appetite um, and strung with a multiple strand necklace. So some little links and then using those little components, uh, little links of chain in between the chain, already made chain, okay? So wrap loops, I just wanna pull a piece of wire, a little bit bigger piece here. And if I was working on this at home, I might have a couple of feet of wire. One of the things you might want to be cautious of with, with working with wire is to make sure that you have left yourself um, enough to make a few links, but if it's so long that you kind of bop yourself in the face, you want to be a little cautious about um, having that wire kind of whipping around. I'm going to use my nylon jaw tool to take that piece of wire and straighten it out. It's got some bends and some kinks in it, and I find that this really helps me quite a bit with getting that feeling of that wire being a little straighter and a little more under control. Okay. When it comes off the spool, it's often very coiled, and if you haven't been very good about caring for your spools of wire and they've gotten kinky or bent, um, the nylon jawed tool will really help remove all those little bits and pieces. Okay. So I'm going to need both chain nose pliers and round nose pliers and flush cutters for this step. I need to add a couple of beads to this little bracelet length. Um, I could also add this to some chain and have a little necklace of this, a little bit of uh, wire wrapping in the front of a little necklace. It might be kind of fun. We could incorporate it into uh, one of the ones we did with the pearls or anything like that. So I'm going to start by making a bend in the wire. And this bend is a nice, crisp 90 degree bend. And the bend it's, itself is part of my loop that I'm going to make. So I use my chain nose plier, and I just press my wire against the jaw of the tool. Now it's really going to take on the shape of that tool. Okay. So I've got enough wire here. If I measure it, I bet it's about two inches. Oh, super close. A couple of inches of wire. This is going to be my loop and my wraps. So I want to have enough wire to work with. It's really painful when you don't leave yourself enough wire, and you're struggling with your hands. All right, so I'm going to next pick up my round nose plier, and I'm going to take it, bring it right up against the bend of the, that right angle bend that I've made, right? So you can see it's tight to it. Now, the place I choose for this wire, further up in the jaws, bigger loop, further down in the jaws, smaller loop, I'm going to do a little bit less than halfway, okay? Kind of a medium-ish size loop, and I'm using some 22 gauge wire. So I'm going to continue with this little bracelet. All right? I'm going to grab my wire, and I'm just going to bring it up and over the top of the plier jaw and around. And then I'm going to take my plier, loosen it, and turn it out of the way. And what this allows me to do is bring that wire back around underneath that little bend that I had, forming my loop. So we have different names in the business for this little point in the, in the wire. Some people like to call it the man with the scarf blowing in the wind. Can you see? Looks like he's riding in a convertible, right? He's bald. He needs a hat. But he's riding in the wind, convertible tops down, and there's that scarf blowing out. This is kind of an important moment in this loop's life. This is a moment where you can attach it to something else. And every link that you make with a bead has two of these moments, one on either side, right? So wrap loops have to be, um, you have to think about them a little bit more. They're something that you want to be kind of in the, in the zone with. If I make simple loops, I can just make simple loops on either side of the bead and just go all day long. But wrap loops, I want to think about what I want to attach it to. And I would like to go ahead and attach this right away to something. So I'm going to grab the ones that I did last night. And I'm going to grab them, and I'm going to slide it down that short wire and pull it till it's inside the loop. So do you see how easy that was? It doesn't really take very much. <sighs> right down in, inside. So now my loops are connected. I'll use my chain nose pliers to grab a hold of that whole loop, just the one. Don't need that guy. And I'm going to wrap that short wire around the stem of the long. And as I'm wrapping, I'm pulling a little bit. I want to pull that a little tighter 
so that that wrap is firm and tight to the wire underneath. Okay. I've made about three wraps. And if you were to look at my jewelry carefully, all my wrap loops, I think you'd find that mostly I make somewhere around two and a half to three and a half wraps in that neighborhood. And that's really kind of my normal. Your normal might be just to make one wrap or four wraps, or you might not have very many beads and you want them to go a long way, then you can make six wraps. Many wraps as you need to do. I'm going to pick up my flush cutter, and again, I want to cut flush to my work. So the flat side of my cutter, tight to my work, cut off the extra. And I like to use my chain nose plier here again to tuck that little end down. So it's smooth and I can't really feel it, okay? Then let's put on a bead. Nicely done. So I'm gonna make the same loop on the other side of the bead, okay? To do that, I need to start all over again. This time I'm gonna start with my bend in my wire. I'm gonna use my chain nose plier to do it. Same, same directions. I'm going to bring my plier in, holding right above my bead, and I'm going to bend my wire over the top of the plier, right? And that creates my little 90 degree bend here. Now I'm going to have to tuck my little plier into that 90 degree bend, and I might have to open it up just a bit. <laughs> Grip gently, take my wire up and over, Plier jaw. And see how it hits the bead in the back? That's okay. Stop and loosen my plier, turn the plier out of the way so I can bring my wire back around to look, be pointing at me. What do you see there? Do you see the man with the scarf again? So this is the second moment <clears throat> I could attach something to this. If I was working with chain, I would want to attach it both loops. But since I'm building a chain, I can just do my attachment at one loop or the other. My tendency is always to use the first loop that I create to attach to my existing work or my clasp. I want to do that because it allows me to continue on that next loop and not have to worry about it. I don't have to think that I'm going to connect anything here. Brandon, any questions? Um, I... No? Well, Janice still has been answering. Oh, good. Yeah, no, she's yeah, she's right on top of it. Good. I love your man with the scarf. That's the last thing I see. I love your man with the scarf. Is Gita? Gita still Thank with you, Gita. Her. She's, she's still. She's plugging along. <laughs> so that little man with the scarf is my signal that I'm going to change pliers. Some folks like to leave our round nose plier in there and grip real firmly, and wind around and around. I don't, and I'll show you why in just one second. I'm going to go ahead and close this loop off so I can finish him off. And I mean complete him, not kill him. Round and around and around. Okay. Take my flush cutters, bring them in. Again, cutting it flush, leaving that flush cut behind on the work. And I'm going to tuck my little end down. Okay. There's my bead attached. Hooray! One down, a million to go. Also another good take-along project because you don't really need very many loose beads. Okay, Let's do another one of those. And I really should have attached to my bracelet here. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm going to take my wire, bend it against my plier jaw, turn it towards me, Round nose plier right up against that corner. Up and over. See how it comes around. A loop is not complete until you've turned your plier and brought the wire underneath again. I had to make smaller loops because I really did small ones on this guy. I'm going to bring my wire down. Loop to loop connected. Hold on to that loop while I wrap it. And this isn't twisting the wires together. This is wrapping one wire around the other. Okay. 
and trim off the extra. Make it snug, not strangling as some as uh, it's Anna true. Said. It's true. Make it snug. Don't get, don't 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 cut off his turtleneck. Make it too tiny. Ah! Okay. And I'm going to add a clasp on this yeah. side. I think I will do this plain and simple. I'm going to take my chain nose pliers. I'm going to grip right at the top of the bead. Now, I'm also gripping right at the tip of these chain nose pliers. I want to make a fairly small bend here because my loop's small and my number of wraps is not too many. If I needed more space, I could move up in the plier. That would mean my bend of my would be further away from my bead and I'd be making more wraps. Okay? But right for now, I'm just going to make kind of a small bend. And I am using the tips of my round nose pliers pretty close to the smallest piece. Up and over and around. As you're learning how to do wire working, if I could give you another piece of advice, start making medium-sized loops rather than driving yourself crazy with ones that are too tiny or too large. Okay, Just medium, in between. I'm going to pick up my clasp, one side of my clasp, and I'm going to slide it down and pull it inside the loop, just like I would if it was another link. Okay. I'm going to hold on to the whole thing with my plier and wrap his wraps right around his neck. Great camera work today, Brandwin. I'm okay. feeling like I'm working at a good focal length and not having to guess what I'm doing. Okay. So there's one side of the bracelet and it needs to toggle the bar of the toggle on the other side. Right? Now if you were going to make this um, and give it away to somebody and you weren't sure of their size, I'd actually choose to use a lobster claw here and maybe add a little piece of chain so that it was adjustable on the other end. And that's one way you can actually make your wire work be more like your um, laddering where you can have multiple button loops but I think a little bit of chain here with the lobster claw to bite into the chain would be a great idea. Okay. Let's do one more loop. I'm going to do that attachment. Good bend. Turn the wire towards me. Grab a hold. Up and over. And around. <laughs> Sorry. I'll stay still for a minute. Loosen and turn my plier. Bring the wire back around to point at me. Okay. And I'm going to attach, again, using that very first loop. Slide it on. And grip hold of it with my chain nose pliers. So one of the things I really like about chain nose pliers is they act like a little stronger pair of fingertips. They keep you from marring your wire. And allow you to hang on to something that your fingers can't quite grip. Right? I saw Faye had a request. What did she want to do? She wants to see your bracelet, which we will have uh, photos of in Oh, yes. Moment. The one I'm wearing? Yes. Absolutely. I know. She's looking at my Ganeshi. Checking out that Ganeshi. Right. <laughs> Grab it's a the hold elephant of this. in the room. So yeah. <laughs> Janice, you're so funny. <laughs> I'm going to grab a hold of that uh, wire as it's coming out of the bead, and I'm going to work at the just the very tip of my plier, right? Bend the wire over. Okay. And I'm going to take my round nose pliers, go up and over, stop, loosen my grip on the plier, and bring the wire back around to point at me. Okay. So, this is a nice, also a nice thing to remind yourself that when you finish that loop and before you pick up your pliers for the next thing, you can actually just take a heartbeat or two or a breath or two and think to yourself, do I have to connect this to anything? Is there anything that I want to put in here? Yes, absolutely.
I'm going to grab that clasp, slide it down inside the loop, and I'm going to hang on to the loop and the clasp and wrap my loop closed. Okay, so if I'm working with chain, that's a moment where I really have to be kind of in the moment and paying attention. You know, wire working is a little, a little more effort than stringing, um, but I really appreciate that building of things from scratch, from just taking a pile of beads and a coil of wire, and then you can make something that's, that's amazing. But while you're wire working, kind of being in the moment, which we should all practice being mindful anyway, being in the moment like this allows you to make fewer mistakes. And it helps you build muscle memory if you're doing something repetitively, but you take a tiny break in between them. Okay, trim off my excess. No more scarf guy. You're kind of done. Okay, all right. They're really distracted. Uh, Jana said you just have to show everybody okay. the bracelet. Okay, I will. Can I show them the other ones that go with it too, I guess? <laughs> Okay, everybody's just losing it, losing their minds, right? All right. Not only is there Ganesh, but there's Buddha, too. Okay. Brand went back to work. Can you come up? Can you come down on yes, them enough? I did. Okay, beautiful. I did. I did. Oh, except you need a little bit. Sorry. I'll put three, all Oops, three of them. Three. Out. Well, I want to. I want to make sure I get them. <laughs> nice oh wait. On okay. Let me. Um, let me do this. How's that? Better. Uh, I keep changing it for you, Brandwin. That's my job. I just want to make sure that everybody gets in on close on the. Yeah. So let's see. So you want to say anything about them or? Sure. I'll say a couple things about them for sure. So these are bracelets that I've made um, collecting beads over the years. Um, these are beads from Kate's old bead store, um, uh, Beadissimo in San Francisco. I bought those there. Um, this silver bead, this silver bead, and this silver bead I made myself. Uh, they're made out of precious metal clay. These are vintage lucite. These are some trade beads here and there. Um, a lampwork glass bead from some unknown but beautifully textured lampwork bead maker, um, and a vintage uh, glass bead. This Ganesh bead, of course, Ganesh is a is a Hindu deity, and he's um, the remover of obstacles, which has always been something that I really um, thought was a good thing um, to have that remover of obstacles around. Uh, this is a, a Venetian glass bead. Um, I like to add some bead spacers. One of the things that I really have enjoyed over the years is how much wire becomes part of my design and is another aesthetic choice that I might make. You know, Softflex is a stringing material. It just kind of holds the beads together, and it does a great job um, for that, but wire really can become part of your design. I use simple loops. We have uh, questions about the gauge and the clasp uh -huh. as well. I'm getting there. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw them <laughs> that's, out there. That's, that's all right. Um, the gauge on these is 14 gauge, which is a very big um, sterling silver wire. But I felt that was uh, warranted because the holes in most of these beads are quite large. Um, when I made these beads, these silver ones out of precious metal clay, I made the holes quite big. Um, and I like to make my own pieces if I can. This particular clasp, and same here and same here, were ones that I made myself. A simple loop at this end, and then I bent a piece of wire, folded it in half, and curved it into the clasp shape, and then did a little wire wrap, which I think you can see pretty clearly here. To make the clasp end, uh, other side of the clasp be stable, I mimicked that same look, so it was very sturdy. So I, I, I built these myself, and that was one of the reasons I brought them was um, I think that this is one of those things in jewelry making that if you want to get into metalsmithing like Kate does, you can. If you want to stick into the stringing mostly, you can. But wire, it's well worth it to have these skills in your toolbox because you can make things that um, are really amazing and, and you've made them from scratch. So wire in this case is a bigger part of my aesthetic than it might be in a place where I have a really thin or really small wire and smaller beads. 
But for me, I wanted this wire to really, really show and to really have that that beefiness to it to kind of go with the beads. Okay. All uh, right. Any other questions? Well, they were talking about uh, whether or not you would need to use a uh, kiln. Kiln. For yeah. That. For the middle clay. Yeah, and they, uh, th that was answered, but good. that yes. was a question yeah. that also came up. Good. Sweet. It is. It is truly beautiful. Thank you. Really lovely work. Yeah, I really like them a lot. As somebody lot. who gets to look at them close up, <laughs> I will tell you, people, they are truly, truly beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I'm also kind of a fan of of mixed materials and finding beads that kind of went together was really fun yeah. to play with. It's, it's got a lovely luminous quality. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I also like my silver to get a little bit tarnished, hmm. but if you're not a fan of that, we actually have a really great polishing pad called a pro polish pad and since we're talking about wire and metal today if you want your silver to be more polished you can use the pro polish pad to remove the oxidization that happens naturally with silver and even the silver the oxidization that you might put on there on purpose but these little pro polish polishing squares do a really great job on silver and they really make it look shiny and clean so how much time goes into making a bracelet you know, um, sometimes these took more time in the design side than in the actual function side. Um, I, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm like saying, oh, I could whip these out in no time at all. But for me, a lot of times when I have to, I have to sort of percolate on my beads for a while. And I might gather a few little beads in a small dish or a bowl or in a little pile on my work table. And they may sit there for a while as, as I find the other components that kind of go with it. Um, you know, I've been collecting beads for a long time now, 20 plus years or so. I think every <laughs> every person I know who does jewelry says that. Yeah, you you can't help but find them. And I, I do find that, I do feel in the, in the historical side of things that as humans, we're kind of programmed to acquire these small adornments that we collect. And collecting them, each one of them has a different feel to me. You know, I love, I love this shape a whole lot, and it's such, a, it's such a different green from this green, and it's got a little bit of blue in it. And the matte quality of, of these older beads when they've just been handled and worn for so long that they have that. And this is a matte surface that was made that way. I mean, this is a recent bead. Um, so I, I tend to, to uh, percolate or marinate with my beads for a while. But the actual putting of together of these might have been an hour or an hour and a half each. I mean, not, not very much in, in that sense, you know, a, a fairly modest amount of time. Um, so these are just ones that I personally have resonance with. They are ones that, that really make me happy. When it comes to making something more exotic, let's show you, let's show you this guy. Although he didn't get a lot of love, he's a really pretty one. Also, some of my favorite types and colors of stones. This is a three strand necklace and um, I have a strand of pearls, a strand of gray moonstone, and a strand of uh, abalone shell and I s used wire, the same color of wire to attach them all with a little daisy spacer, another really wise spacer to have in your um, supplies uh, to give those abalone a little kick and this is a much longer process. This might have taken four or five hours to make from start to finish um, in, in the sense that there's much more lengths and many more wraps and connections to make, right? Mm -hmm. And we did get some more questions about your necklace as well. Ah, okay, the one I have on right now? Mm -hmm. Let me slide him off. So one of the design features that I like about wire is your ability to add little spacers and little bits and pieces to it. <clears throat> and to embellish it also with using more materials like other chain or other materials. So one of the things I did on this um, green coin pearl necklace was I used a soldered jump ring, which is these ones in between, and they're actually in different sizes. Um, and I used that as just the spacer in between the links. For me, it gives it a little bit more of a chain feel as it's finished it moves a little bit more like a chain does. I wanted to use, <coughs> excuse me, um, slightly different rings because these pearls were all the same and it needed a little more something else. 
it needed a little change up. So having those little odd shaped spacers in there kind of for me gives it a little bit more um, of a variation. Something to, something for you to, some reason for you to walk, look around all this whole piece, right? And this one, um, I used some Appetite and some Blue Pearls, and they have very tiny little spacer beads on them, uh, or little bead caps. And one thing I like about a bead cap is that it helps merge the materials. So it makes a connection between the bead itself and the chain and the wire. And it sort of brings them together a little bit. I actually have a couple on these bracelets too. I'm sure they did not escape anyone's notice, but I will bring them back and show them again. I also like bead caps because sometimes they can be a real functional thing. Um, there are bead caps here, this little bead. And this bead is not drilled as true as it could be. I can see it's a little off. So it's a little lopsided, but the caps help straighten it up a bit. I know that this particular bead uh, is a Venetian made in Italy bead, and they always tend to have kind of rough holes around the edges. They'll tend to have not a perfect hole. So throwing a little bead cap on top of those actually kind of hides that, and really no one knows I'm hiding anything. They just think I'm embellishing, right? So those little design pieces that you bring into your work, make them more yours and make them more unique um, and certainly more interesting to look at too. Right. Cool. Good. Sorry, you guys, I'm rambling on and on and on today. And Faye, you are absolutely right. They, I noticed that you said they help to with the wobbling factor, and you are correct. So what Faye is kind of talking about is um, if the bead is, the hole in the bead is not true drilled, in other words, it's a little off on one side, or the hole is really large, and you're using a smaller bead, or smaller wire, the um, bead cap on either end of the bead actually helps the bead get, the wire get a little bit more centered on the stringing material. So that's, that's also uh, correct, Faye. So I have one more little piece to finish, and I, I didn't quite finish it off last time. And I think I, I should put the clasp on here so that everybody gets to see that last wrapped loops one more time. So I stopped with um, an added little crystal bead, and I thought that these um, cuties went really well with them. Um, you know, these, this uh, magnetic clasp is useful on bracelets for sure. It makes it much easier to put on and take off for everybody. Um, even if you don't have mobility problems with your hands or arthritis or anything going on, oh boy, does it make it easy. One thing you'll notice is it tries to stick to your tools. So that's okay. I'm just going to let it, let it be. I'll go ahead and wrap this guy closed. I hope you guys enjoyed today's class. I had a really good time talking away here. Boy, I tell you, you can just get me started and I'll just go, go, go. Okay that end and we'll bring this end around and up oh, take the magnet off there we go and slip it into the loop that's there there we go and hang on to my loop hold on magnet clasp and wrap it right around go. Bang, look at that, how quick that was, right? Neat. And I think that little cutie goes really well with those pearls. Um, you know, with wire and with findings, um, one of the things in class, one of the things that you can play around with a little bit is proportion um, of how the wire and the beads work. You know, if you had some very delicate beads and they had happened to have really big holes, you could use a beefier gauge of wire, and it would be really interesting. And vice versa, too. You might find a really large bead with a really small um, hole in it and have to use a smaller gauge of wire. And that's okay. You'll, you'll find the solution. The, um, uh, the fun of all this is kind of making your own things from scratch. And I really enjoy it. It's one of the things I really love to do. Okay. So, I think we're kind of coming to the end of the day. Um, 
Got any other questions out there, Bradwin? Anything else I need no. to address? Um, I don't. Uh, we did say we they'd address it later on. But okay. There was some question about soldering. Um, Head uh, pins? Um, no. Um, oh, jump, jump rings. rings. Versus. Soldered jump ring versus open jump ring. Yes. Right. So and whether or not you used soldered jump rings. I did. Okay. I used soldered jump rings in this particular piece, if that's the one we're after. Yeah. I did use soldered jump rings. And um, they're kind of a decorative thing that I acquired somewhere along the line. Um, again, it's the things that throw you get thrown into your stash, and then they kind of come out when, when you need them. So just a, soldered, a solid soldered ring. You could actually use um, some of our spacer beads, and I know we have um, we have some really nice disc speed disc beads right now too, don't we? That are kind of uh, the Heshi. not the Heshi. They're bigger glass ones. Um, those ones right in that aisle, <laughs> right there. Um, you could actually use those as a soldered ring and wire wrap. Yeah, middle row starts with white and blue. I think. Yeah, grab those pink ones. This, this here? Sure. Perfect. The, yeah, what are these guys called? The Ashanti saucers. Ashanti saucers. These are really cool. Um, in a funny twist of fate, I would actually use these kind of in the opposite way. So I would use them as my spacer. Um, so here it is in this connection. So I would wire wrap into this and then make a link, and then wire wrap over here too. I think it would be a really cool look, and it would be a really great um, uh, element to have in a necklace or in a bracelet. I think that would look really great. So yeah, a soldered ring. Um, and these, even these Ashanti spacers would look great this way. Yeah. Right? Ooh, what about with this guy right here? Ooh, that might look really fun. Actually, it might be really fun to do all three of those and just keep repeating. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Rot row, another project. <laughs> right? So that means that wire would come out of this bead and it would make a large loop and get wrapped closed. And then it would go through the bead on the other side, make a loop, and get wrapped closed. I think that would be really cool looking, actually. And I would use a big wire. I would use some 18 gauge wire, maybe. Hmm. So, a couple of bits of business bookkeeping that we still have to do today. Um, we have a Facebook giveaway for today. Should I uh, move the camera? Sure, yeah. Perhaps? We're ready. <laughs> perhaps, we perhaps. have a Facebook giveaway today that is pretty darn spectacular. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we did a raffle, and we're going to do a raffle today as well. Now, I know that some of you have um, lots of, don't tilt me, should I tilt, I shouldn't tilt my head. <laughs> I know that some of you have tools and things at home and supplies, but I really like to um, bolster those supplies and make sure you have a lot of goodies. So today's uh, giveaway is a raffle. There is one winner today, so we have one spectacular package coming your way. Um, I have five spools of wire, and they're in one or two in all of our colors that we have. So we have antique copper, antique bronze, silver, a little more antique copper, and gold. So it's quite a nice supply. So it's different gauges so you can experiment and you can learn for yourself what you like. We also have a package of Pro Polish pads for polishing. Everybody needs jewelry, everybody's jewelry needs polishing from time to time. A fresh pair of flush cutters. If you've been flush cutting, cutting and really struggling with those cuts, nice fresh pair of flush cutters to work with. And a pair of nylon jawed wire straightening pliers also comes in this beautiful package. Okay, So this is quite a lovely one-off. Everyone who places an order in the next hour so from now until about 1 o'clock. And you will want to mention in your comments to enter oh, oh. Tucson Tools to get entered in this drawing. We will choose one lucky winner 
to get this whole package of goodies. And that package will come to you in a bead shop canvas bag. Also. So for carrying your supplies from one event to the next or around your house or storing things or showing that you love the bead shop, your canvas bag and your kit of supplies. Please put in your order notes, Tucson Tools, to be entered in this lovely giveaway. Okay? Um, we will randomly choose one lucky winner at after 1 o'clock, after all orders are in from that time fra frame. And that's uh, from now on. doesn't matter the size of your order, any size you might like. But I have a feeling you might be placing a really good sized order. I have about three and a half hours to get to the airport. And I'm going to Tucson. And I'm going to meet up with Kate. So we have a store-wide sale that runs for the next till midnight. Another 12 hours. It's 25% off. It's an amazing deal. This is a good time to stock up on tools. If you don't have all the tools, pick some up. You can't really wire work without the tools. And I promise you, you're going to want them. You don't have to buy tools over and over. You're going to buy one set and keep them for a long time. So please put in your coupon code M25. And really, I don't like the name Emmy, but I love the name M because that's what my family calls me. So you are all now my family, and you get to call me M as well. M25 will get you 25% off your order. If you do it in the next hour before 1 o'clock, you will get entered in the drawing for the big package of goodies coming your way. So I think we have come to the end of our time. Do we have any other questions? Any last minute comments? Yeah, everybody's just getting excited. Ooh! <laughs> you guys are and excited. You to have a safe I am trip. so excited. <laughs> it was really hard to get up to work, come to work today and go, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't get too excited because it's hours away. So I'm flying to Phoenix and then I will drive and meet up with Kate and stay with her tonight and tomorrow night. And we will, we will Facebook Live you from Tucson, from a couple of venues, I promise. It'll be really fun. And I'm only going to be there for two days. So I'm back to work on, far, on Saturday, my other gig. So entered in the tools, Tucson Tools, for the next hour. 25% off your order, M25. Okay? It's been real, guys. I can't wait to see you next week. We have a really another fun show coming the week next week, the week after that, the week after that. We're just working like crazy. So thank you so much for coming and participating. We'll see you on Facebook. We'll see you on YouTube. Um, don't forget to watch and uh, download your information page for WIRE. And we'll see you next week. Okay. Signing off. I'm heading for the airport. Bye.